Hello, and welcome to the podcast, Buffy and the Art and Story. If you love Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you love creating stories or just taking them apart to see how they work, you're in the right place. Today, I'm looking at Season 7, Episode 15, Get It Done, where Buffy meets the Shadow Men, a demon plagues Sunnydale, and Robin Wood learns a whole lot more about Sunnydale and Spike. I am Lisa M. Lilly, author of the Awakening Supernatural thriller series, the QC Davis Mysteries, and the Writing as a Second Career Books for Writers. Along with the recap of Get It Done, today we'll explore what links Andrew, Willow, and Spike as characters, how the story arcs of Willow, Spike, and Buffy explore the nature of power, small steps throughout the story, that build so that we believe that Buffy, Spike, and Willow make the major choices they do, and why in this episode Dawn is easy to love and Kennedy is easy to hate. As always, there will be no spoilers except the end when I talk about foreshadowing for the season, but I'll give you plenty of warning. Okay, let's dive into the Hellmouth. Get It Done aired the first time on February 18, 2003. It was written and directed by Douglas Petrie. It starts with some opening conflict, which is there to draw the viewers quickly into the story. And here it foreshadows some major plot developments. Buffy walks through her house at nighttime. It's dark. She straightens pillows, picks up a book. Potential sleep on the floor all around her. She goes through a door and sees Chloe crying in a corner, and she says, Chloe? It is Chloe, right? A callback to the episode where Buffy mixed up Eve and Chloe, and Eve was the first. Some foreshadowing that we will see the first again, this time appearing as Chloe. But Buffy is interrupted because the first slayer dives at her from the side and knocks her down the stairs. At the bottom, the first slayer is on top of Buffy and says, it's not enough. Buffy wakes up in her own bed, potential sleeping on the floor around her. And at 1 minute 27 seconds, we go to credits. On return, Anya and Spike walk together and she tells him she doesn't see why she let herself become human again, which happened in Selfless. She goes on that she's always icky on the inside, disgusting on the outside. He tells her her outsides aren't so bad. She says what's worse is living with all those potentials. She'll call the health inspector if one more moves in. But Spike likes his plan better. Get up, get out, get drunk, repeat as needed. They're walking arm in arm, and Anya says that at first she thought it was weird, Spike asking her on a date. He's a little taken aback and tells her he's just out for the alcohol. But then she jokes that she'll drink him under the table. Of course, once down there, she could join him. And she says, kidding, she likes sex on top of the table a reference to their one time together. She can see that Spike is not into it, which is why she keeps kind of saying it's a joke, and Spike finally says, would you let it go? You're like a dog with a bone. And Anya says, so what? Spike responds, it's my bone. Just drop it. She's a little offended and tells him she wasn't proposing. But time goes by and a girl gets hungry. He says, thank God, because a demon appears behind her and attacks. The demon tells her De Hoffren says she dies. So that is a change from selfless where De Hoffren killed Hallie as a punishment to Anya for choosing to go back to being a human. He wanted Anya to suffer, but he has apparently changed his mind. Spike fights off the demon, but then surprises Anya by grabbing her and urging her to run, so he does not kill that demon, and she is not thrilled. We are about 10% through the episode, and usually by this time we see a story spark or inciting incident 
that sets the main plot rolling. It's hard to pick exactly one moment in this episode, though there is clearly plenty of conflict. Buffy's dream that it's not enough plays into her later decisions, as does Spike, making this choice to run because when Buffy learns of it, it will be part of her feeling that she's the only one who's really in this fight. But I think what really sets off the main plot is Chloe's death, which occurs off screen. Without that, the other elements would set off some sort of a story at some point, but not immediately and not the same story. The scene cuts to Robin Wood and Buffy in his office. He admonishes two boys who got into a fist fight. After he lets them go, he tells Buffy it's the third fight this week. Vandalism is rising. Three students are missing. Buffy agrees the Hellmouth has begun its semi-annual percolation. And she adds it's a little sooner than they thought things would get this bad. Robin Wood is worried because he's just a guy. And he adds, quote, granted, a cool, sexy vampire fighting guy, end quote, and he gives Buffy a large, antique-looking leather bag that belonged to his mother. It should have been passed down through the Slayer line, but he couldn't let it go. His mother told him it was for an emergency. Robin asks to see where Buffy works. She refers to her desk, but he means her other work, her real work. We cut to her bringing Robin Wood into the house and telling him about the potentials and all the watchers being killed. Andrew stalks out wearing oven mitts and asks where the hell she's been. The funnel cake is kicking his ass. She explains that Andrew is their hostage, though he prefers guestage. Robin Wood is a little confused, and Buffy explains that Andrew was evil, people got killed, and now he bakes. This is the second time we see a character who was evil and is now, if not entirely good, trying to be good, working on Buffy's side. Before this, we saw Anya, who used to be a demon. And this will be a theme of the episode, characters who are on that line. Andrew now complains to Buffy that if they keep bringing new people in, they'll see the big board of strategy, and Buffy says they don't have one of those, but he shows her a large whiteboard where he drew bringers and vampires and so forth. I tended on first watch and quite a few rewatches to find Andrew kind of annoying. I never really understood why they spend so much time with him. But on the Buffy and the Art of Facebook page, someone commented, and I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly who, that the value of Andrew is the humor that he brings. And it is a good point because our main characters, things are so difficult in season six, and they are coming out of that in season seven, out of their personal difficulties, but now they're facing this huge evil, and it's harder to give them the humor and have Buffy be quippy the way she used to be, given the way life is. So Andrew adds some lightness to the season. Buffy and Robin go out to the yard. She tells him they have more than the big board. The Potentials are working on battle moves there, including kicks. Kennedy calls out positions and moves. And then she berates Chloe for her form and calls her a maggot. Then she turns to Buffy and Principal Wood and says she loves this job. And she asks who the hell he is. When Buffy explains, she asks, doesn't he think they look ready to kick some ass? Wood, though, doubts that the first has an ass that they can kick. Amanda waves to Principal Wood, excited to see him outside of school. An interesting mix of Buffy's two lives. This scene, which is partly played for fun, gradually builds Buffy's frustration and doubts about what they're doing, which started with 
the first layer saying it's not enough. And whether that was really the first layer or that was Buffy's unconscious, she feels that way. And as she looks at the potentials, she tells Robin that he's right. It's not enough. He counters that he didn't say that. It's an impressive group of recruits. And Buffy clarifies that they weren't recruited. They were chosen. And they're not all going to make it. Some will die and nothing she can do will stop that. I talked a bit about this in the bonus episode for patrons about Buffy, power, and war. This distinction Buffy makes between recruits and, I said at the time, people who are drafted. Buffy says chosen, which certainly has more gravitas to it and sounds better than drafted. But ultimately... Buffy struggles with that. None of these girls and young women asked to be part of this fight. Neither did Buffy when it comes down to it, but she's had seven years plus to learn how to be the slayer, how to use her power, how to fight, and they are just thrown in there. And she really struggles with the weight of trying to protect them all and to see them as a fighting force. Because of that model of war and the military treating recruits or draftees as disposable, Willow comes out with a bunch of weapons, sees Principal Wood, and tries to stutter out a cover story about the school pep dance, saying, bring it on. Buffy tells her it's okay, Robin knows, and Willow is relieved she had nothing to explain the weapons. Then he asks Willow about her experimenting. Willow's eyes widen and he clarifies he means the magics. She tells him it's nothing too heavy, just lighter, safer stuff. Another tiny moment that adds to Buffy's growing feeling that the others around her are not able to or willing to harness the power they have and that it's not going to be enough. Before Willow leaves, we get another bit of fun because she says, in an aside to Buffy, so much cooler than Snyder. When she's gone, Robin says she really almost destroys the world. He says to remind him never to make Willow crabby, and Buffy thinks it might be better if he did. The first is coming, and she has an army with nothing to hit, a wicca who won't, and the brains of it all is wearing oven mitts. So now we have seen another character who is walking that line of evil, not evil, and it's escalating it in a way because when Willow taps into her power, she is afraid it will take her entirely to the dark side. Now Principal Wood wants to see the vampire which is how he refers to Spike. And Spike is yet another character who has spent some time, a lot of time, on that line. At 11 minutes 37 seconds, Anya and Spike argue in the basement. She's mad that he didn't just kill the demon because she's sure that demon will come after her again. She calls Spike a wimpire. He reasons that if he fought the demon and the demon got lucky and killed Spike, then Anya gets killed too, and Spike is out of the equation. It was smarter to leave. Anya stalks off. Buffy and Robin overhear the end of the conversation, and Robin says he hopes they're not intruding. But Spike welcomes him. He says the more good guys, the better, and Robin asks if Spike's a good guy articulating the question that was in the background for Anya, Andrew, and Willow. And Robin is confrontational about this. Spike doesn't know why, but the tension is clear and they spar a bit, including Spike joking about killing people but saying it was the old him. Robin wants to know about the old him and about the soul. Spike's a little put out with Buffy saying that was a big deal, very private. And he goes on, what are you just telling everyone now? Robin and Spike end up face to face a few feet apart. Spike says he went to great lengths to get himself a soul. He's unique, more or less, a reference to Angel. 
And Robin asks how it's working out and how long he's been in Sunnydale and where he was before. Spike just says around, and Buffy steps into the frame almost between them and says they need to go upstairs. The scene cuts to Dawn telling Buffy she looked at the bag that Robin brought over. She says there are trinkets and a Sumerian book. And she says, did you know that ancient Sumerians did not speak English? Buffy says they're worse than the French. Dawn adds that there's a large, unopenable box. Buffy asks if Dawn has any real homework, and Dawn tells her she's got a system flunking out. Then she jokes, no, it's paying someone to do her work, and then says she's kidding, but she loves to see Buffy's eyeballs change color. Another reason I am liking Dawn more is days. Buffy is treating her better, mostly, and Dawn, when Buffy asks, asks about homework, doesn't get defensive. She jokes with Buffy, and she's kind of tweaking her sister and enjoying it. So I really like that we get to see Dawn both playing an important role in all of this and having a little fun. And then this moment is completely flipped because Buffy opens a door, they're walking through the house, and Chloe is behind it and she has hung herself. This moment is at 14 minutes, 51 seconds. So it's more than a third through the episode, but I see it as that first major plot turn that comes from outside the protagonist, spins the story in a new direction, and raises the stakes. So often in a novel, we see that a quarter way through. In movies and TV, it's usually a quarter to a third of the way through. It's a little farther into the episode here. As with other episodes this season, there's a lot to put in that relates to the season arcs. And so these major plot turns are not always at those set points, but it does exactly what it needs to do because this raises the stakes exponentially and turns the whole story as Buffy tries to deal with this. Dawn shrieks, we cut to a commercial. On return, Kennedy runs in and gasps. Rona is behind her and the first appears as Chloe. And one of them says, you're not Chloe. And the first responds that neither is she anymore, referring to Chloe's body. The first tells all of them that it just talked to Chloe all night, and Chloe's a good listener. And the first addresses Kennedy and says, like, when you called her a maggot, she really heard that. The first goes on that Chloe got it. The first is coming, and they'll all be gone. Buffy tells the first that they'll be there, and the first asks, will all of them? And repeats what Buffy said in Buffy's voice about some of them will die and Buffy won't be able to stop it. And the first says, hey, I didn't say it. The first then says it'll be seeing all of them one by one, TTFN. It disappears. Rona explains that the initials stand for Tata for now. It's what Tigger says when he leaves. And Amanda tells them Chloe loved Winnie the Pooh. This detail emphasizes that these are girls, whether or not Chloe was under 18 or over 18. It's an imagery of girls dragged into this fight put in danger and adds to that weight on Buffy of not having been able to protect them. In the next scene, Buffy digs a grave. She's alone in the yard in the dark. I did not notice this, but it is next to Annabelle's grave. I saw that on the Buffy fandom wiki. Buffy isn't crying, but she looks like she wants to. She doesn't show this grief or vulnerability to the group, though. Today we have comments. One is from patron Melissa about potential. And she says, potential contains my favorite Dawn plot. Admittedly, that's a contest with few contenders. Dawn's most consistent trait is that she wants to be respected slash valued, 
and being a slayer seems a pretty good way to achieve it. But she accepts that she's not chosen in a heartbeat when it matters most. That's integrity, commitment to something more than herself, which is huge for Dawn, really for many people. We've watched her struggle for recognition for a couple of seasons now, and it's beautiful to see her accept that she's not the one, despite having feelings about it, and lovely for Xander to acknowledge her with encouragement and without bitterness. Thanks, Melissa. I, too, loved Dawn in that episode, and in Get It Done, I'm really enjoying her character as well. I would have loved to have seen more of this Dawn in this season. Roberta commented regarding the episode on grief and the Buffy verse where Tiffany Neheiser and I talked. Roberta says, this conversation was fascinating. It spurred a brand new thought about Buffy's insistence on saving Dawn. She couldn't save her mother, so she had to save Dawn. This was an extension of that grief. It was all unconscious and automatic, of course, just the machinery of her brain. Who's the Buffy bot now, am I right? And then Tiffany defined the bargaining stage in a way I've never heard that makes so much sense. So applying that to this scenario, Buffy saving Dawn was bargaining, plus the depression. If I'm the very best and I do the most heroic thing, that will restore some order. Roberta, I love these observations. And it does put Buffy needing to save Dawn her insistence on it, even in the face of knowing that the whole world might be pulled into that hell dimension or everyone killed, she knows it, but she cannot let Dawn go. And yes, it's Buffy the hero and Buffy the sister, but I think you're right on. It's also part of her grief. And that need to make sense of the world and restore order, which is such a huge part of that bargaining process. I, too, loved Tiffany's comments on that. Finally, from Billy or William on Facebook, this is about Kennedy. I had made some comments about her in previous episode. And his comments also touch on Get It Done. He says, I don't understand why another love interest was forced on Willow at all after Tara's death. Willow was not okay in season seven. She was not ready. I don't like Kennedy anyway, but even so, the relationship ended up rushed. And I think by the end, it was made out they were way closer than they were. What really bugs me as well is how Kennedy seems to think Dark Willow is just a cool joke, and when Willow's magic actually affects her in episode 15, she gets mad at Willow as if she hasn't warned her so many times. I could go on and on, honestly. Season 7 put time into a lot of the wrong things, in my opinion. I would rather see more Willow and Buffy, Xander and Anya, Buffy and Dawn, etc. As I said, I could go on and on about this. Billy, I think you pinpointed something important that aside, well, several things important, but I hadn't really thought about it in those terms that aside from whether we like or don't like Kennedy, it is really soon for Willow to get involved with someone new. And she is clear in the beginning that she isn't ready for that, which we see play out. In the episode where she turns into Warren. And this too goes back to grief. Willow may not have been at the stage in her grieving process where she was ready to move on. Thank you to everyone for the comments. If anyone else would like to comment, you can email me at buffystorypod at gmail.com. Comment on the Facebook page for Buffy and the Art of Story or comment on Patreon or YouTube. Going back to the conversation about grief with Tiffany Neheiser, Buffy is keeping her emotions in 
check. It's a very small amount of sadness that she allows herself to express, but only when she's alone. And it calls back to when Joyce was home from the hospital and Buffy's downstairs with the music turned up doing dishes and just sobbing, but she never lets herself fall apart in front of anyone. Now everyone gathers in the living room. Many of them are crying or talking in hushed tones. Buffy comes in and asks if anyone wants to say a few words about Chloe. No one does. And now we see Buffy expressing her grief in anger, another way grief often comes out. And I also read this as fear. When we're afraid, we often react with anger. And I feel like Buffy is more deeply afraid than she has ever been as the Slayer. But that is not how it sounds to everyone else. Buffy says, after no one else wants to say a few words about Chloe, Buffy says, let me. Chloe was an idiot. Chloe was stupid. She was weak. Buffy tells them that anyone who's in a rush to die, just do what Chloe did. Buffy says she's the slayer, the one with the power, and the first has her using it to dig their graves. She throws the shovel down and says she's been carrying all of them too far, too long, and the ride is over. Kennedy stands and tells Buffy she's out of line. Willow says she's not, and Kennedy argues that Willow should not defend Buffy. These anger in addition to fear and grief, also arises from all those small steps. Andrew, who's a guest with his oven mints, complaining about the big board. Willow saying she's doing simple spells, nothing major. Buffy hearing that Spike ran from a demon. Kennedy protests that Buffy isn't even the most powerful one with Willow there. She's not even close. And Buffy tells Kennedy she's new and she's wrong because Buffy uses the power she has. The rest are just waiting for her. Xander now steps in and says that only because she told them to, she's the leader as in they follow, which is really interesting because Xander told Andrew that they don't follow Buffy, they are Buffy's friends. And I'm not sure what Xander means by that's what she told them to do. I could be forgetting something from previous episodes, so if anything jumps out to you, I would love to hear about it. I read Xander as stepping in because of his loyalty to Willow, but otherwise, I'm not entirely sure why this is the stand he takes. But he does remind Buffy that they're also her friends. And Anya says she's not. And Buffy responds, then why are you here aside from getting rescued? What is it that you do? Anya answers, I provide much needed sarcasm. And Xander says, oh, that'd be my job, actually. Buffy says Anya's there because she's scared. And this answers a question that I've had throughout the season since the potentials arrived, which is Anya and Xander both have their own apartments, so why are they crowded in at Buffy's when it is so crowded there already? And I guess that is it. Everyone is scared. It's more of a safety and numbers thing. So Buffy has just said Anya's scared. Xander tells her that's true for everyone. And Buffy says, fine, be scared if they want to. Just be useful while they're doing it. Willow now tells her everyone's doing all they can, and Buffy says the first isn't impressed. It knows them, and it's laughing at them. If they want to surprise the enemy, surprise themselves. Do what they think they can't, or they're not an army, just a bunch of girls waiting to be picked off. Spike starts to leave, and Buffy tells him to take a cell phone, and if she needs someone to get weepy or wail done, she'll call him. He is a little bit shocked and doesn't see why she's saying this, and she tells him if he keeps holding back, he might as well be gone. He admits that since he got his soul back, he hasn't quite been relishing the kill the way he did, but he got the soul because it's what Buffy wanted. 
which is a little bit of a retcon on Spike's part, not the writer's, because Buffy didn't tell him to go get a soul. All the same, I understand what he's saying. He did it to be more human, to try to be good. So again, we have that line of power, evil, and good, and is being, quote unquote, good, making Spike less powerful? The same question as we have about Willow. Buffy tells him she wants the dangerous Spike, the Spike that tried to kill her when they met. Spike responds, oh, you don't know how close you are to bringing him out. But Buffy says, I'm nowhere near him. She tells Dawn to get the potentials upstairs and break out the emergency kit she's declaring an emergency. This happens right at the midpoint of the episode and that is where in a very strongly structured story we see the protagonist making a major commitment going all in on the quest throwing caution to the wind or suffering a major reversal buffy saying okay break open the emergency kit is a bit of a commitment because it's an unopenable box, there's a suggestion that maybe you can only use it once. But there is a stronger commitment later, which is a great way to build your story and ensure it keeps driving forward. Have that commitment and have something even more intense later. For now, we cut to the living room. Robin is there too. Buffy thought he'd want to take part since it's his mother's emergency kit. She breaks open that unopenable locked box in the Slayer bag. And Xander jokes around with the metal figurines that are inside. They're uh, flat. And he jokes that they are puppets. And oh, that's the answer. The first can be defeated with puppets. They just need to find Miss Piggy and Kermit. The others tell him that that's Muppets. Dawn tells him that they're shadow casters. You put them in motion and they tell the story and the text says you can't just watch, you have to see. Xander worries that every time instructions are cryptic, someone gets hurt, usually him. Dawn thinks it's an origin myth, the story of the very first Slayer, and Buffy tells them about seeing the first Slayer in her dream. So that first sequence foreshadowed both Chloe's death and that we were going to learn about the first Slayer. The scene cuts to total darkness, match lights. Dawn tells them, based on the book, which she struggles a little bit with, to put the shadow casters on one by one. And they go on this sort of turntable and... They should start with the earth, and we see these jagged hills and a moon over it, and drumming starts in the background. Xander comments on how creepy it is, so we know this isn't just a soundtrack. They are all hearing it. Then Dawn says you put in the demons, then men, and the men found a girl, and now they're screaming in the background, and this is all taking place with just that light from the candle and it's casting shadows on the wall as dawn talks the turntable starts to spin so this is more horror than we've gotten in a lot of buffy it is frightening and disturbing and we don't know what's coming next dawn struggles more with a translation that says the men chained the girl to the earth and then she gets frustrated, says she can't read anymore. It's something about darkness. It can't be shown. You must see, but only if you're willing to make the exchange. Xander asks when she got so good at Sumerian, and Dawn says it's not in Sumerian anymore. When the book is flashing, the letters are changing. Willow stands as the wheel with the shadow casters spins faster. Everything is moving now, and it keeps whirling and whirling. A bright light and a cube of energy appears in the center of the room. It's glowing and fluctuating, and Buffy says it means she has to go in to see. The others try to stop her. They don't know how to get her back or what the exchange is. 
she tells them to find a way and dives in. So this is truly going all in on the quest and throwing caution to the wind. She doesn't know where she's going or how she'll get back. And we believe Buffy would do that both because of how her character has built through the whole show. We saw her dive into that energy portal, believing it would save Dawn. So we know Buffy does these things. But just in this episode as well, so well built, Buffy's frustration, her fears, her feelings that something major has got to change. The cube disappears, and then there's a bright flash, and a giant demon appears in Buffy's place. It throws Xander across the room, and we cut to a commercial. On return, showing that she hasn't absorbed Willow's struggle with magic at all, Kennedy just says to Willow, use her magic and send him back. The demon knocks Kennedy and Willow aside. Kennedy and Dawn then try to fight it with swords. When that doesn't work, Spike starts fighting as well. He gets tossed through the ceiling. There is lots of carnage. It runs off, and Xander tells Willow it's spell o'clock. They've got to figure out how to get Buffy back. Anya thinks there's no hope of Willow doing it without going off the rails, but Willow says it's the only way. So as I talked about in the previous episode, there are a lot of events here that force characters to make choices and to grow. Willow now is faced with a choice. Does she use her magic if she can and risk going to that evil side of it to get Buffy back? The scene cuts to Buffy, who is in a bright desert, much like the one where she saw the first Slayer in Primeval, that dream episode at the end of season four. In the Summer's home, Willow says she doesn't know what magic to use. Kennedy somewhat flippantly says, why not just try all 32 flavors? One thing I will say about Kennedy's character, she is consistent. She does not recognize the risks to Willow of using magic or the danger that magic can pose to anyone. And this is despite that she saw that a spell turned Willow into Warren. Anya points out that there is a choice here. Leave Buffy out there or risk Willow's life and everyone else's lives. Robin says Buffy could stay lost. They can't do that. And Anya responds, you missed her everyone sucks but me speech. If she's so superior, let her find her own way back. This feels a bit off to me. Yes, Buffy gave a pretty intense speech. She was very hard on everyone, but it seems extreme that Anya wants to leave Buffy out there. I would like it a little better if it was framed as Anya just being practical, saying the thing no one wants to say, because there is a choice. Buffy is a slayer, maybe she could find her own way back. I guess I, I just don't love bitter Anya as much as I like practical, blunt Anya. There is some justification for it in the text because we got those references early in the episode to Anya becoming human again and to Hoffren wanting to kill her all of which happened in Selfless, where Buffy did kill Anya. It didn't stick, but Buffy put a sword through her, thought she killed her. At the time, though, Anya seemed to take it as that is Buffy's job. She didn't take it personally, but she certainly has since then, so I suppose it's fair to think that Anya might feel bitter and, and think, well, just let Buffy take her chances. One more reason, though, that it doesn't quite work for me is that everyone stands a better chance with Buffy there than not there. And Xander points this out. He says the first is already up and running. Without Buffy, it can show up any second. And now I'll take the other side of that and say the first shows up with Buffy present. So it isn't entirely clear that Buffy moves the needle that much one way or the other. Dawn, though, the one who is really practical here, asks Willow if another witch was to try this, what would she start with? And this is such a great strategy. 
And I love that Don suggests it. It takes the pressure off Willow. It sets aside the question of should Willow do this? What will happen if she does? And just says, hey, if somebody, not you, was going to do this, how would you tell them to start? Willow talks about physics, the basic laws of conservation of energy. You can't create or destroy, just transfer. Anya argues, tells her that's the wrong direction. She needs a catalyst, a conduit. And by arguing, they start brainstorming together. Kennedy does make a contribution here, pointing out they need the demon to make the exchange, should it be dead or alive. And Spike, somewhat recovered from being thrown, I think, through the ceiling, appears and votes for dead. And he tells Willow to get Kraken. He'll go get the demon. Kennedy doubts it. He can barely stand. And she says, quote, we're trained, unquote, which also fits Kennedy thinking that she is as strong as a vampire and she can do better. I suppose she makes a decent point here that all they know about this demon is it kicks Spike's ass. And Spike says it did at that which shows real confidence to just acknowledge his defeat. Robin asks where he's going, and he says there's something he needs. In that desert, Buffy approaches three men with staffs. They speak to her, I think, in Sumerian. We get subtitles. She introduces herself. They say they already know who she is. She asks how she can understand them, and then guesses it's due to ancient magics. They walk in a circle around her as they tell her she is the Hellmouth's last guardian. Buffy is confused, don't they mean the latest? But they don't answer, and they tell her they can't give her knowledge, only power. She starts to muse aloud that this isn't really happening. It's like a hologram, and one of them clubs her over the head and knocks her out. Dawn pours a circle of green sand, explaining that they need to get the portal back. Kennedy, completely in character, says, Now what? We hold hands and chant Kumbaya or something? Ugh. I just don't know how Willow tolerates someone who is so dismissive of magic, both the good and the bad sides of it. She just, though, says maybe she's working on her best guess. Sander thinks they should wait to see if Spike gets the demon, but Willow responds that it might take her days to open this portal. She sits within the circle, starts chanting in Latin, and nothing happens. Willow turns around, tells Dawn to put on some coffee. This could take a while, but there's a flash. Willow's eyes turn black, and she screams. So another scary moment here. And as with the previous ones, it is mixed with deep emotions. The first slayer attacking Buffy is against that backdrop of Buffy's own fears that it's not enough. Chloe's death, which is both horrifying and sad, and the shadow casters drumming and Willow screaming, and we're fearful for Willow and also fearful for everyone. This moment really shows the edge that Willow is on. She might save Buffy or not, and she might turn evil herself. We cut to Buffy waking up chained in a cave. She's able to stand, but the chains hold her into a small area, and the shadow men tell her, and I keep saying shadow men because of the shadow casters. They are men. They're not shadows. They tell her they were there at the beginning. They brought her here for this, for the source of the Slayer's power. She argues with them, and the leader says the first Slayer didn't talk so much. They pound their stats in unison. The drumming from before sounds again, and one of them brings out a small, very old box, opens it, and says it's the energy of the demon, its spirit, and its heart, and this is how they created the first Slayer. Today's podcast is sponsored by Creating Compelling Characters from the Inside Out by L.M. Lilly, which is me under my clever nonfiction pseudonym. 
No matter what type of fiction you write or want to write, as Buffy the Vampire Slayer shows, it's the characters that keep the readers coming back. If the reader doesn't care about them, the most gripping plot won't carry the day. So how do you get your readers to care? Character diagrams, checklists, and charts can take you only so far. You need to know your characters and love or hate them. I'm thinking of you, Kennedy, just as you do real people. In this book, you'll explore your characters' lives, loves, and values so you can understand what drives them to do what they do. Creating compelling characters from the inside out includes questions and prompts designed to help you peer into your characters' hearts and minds, and examples from popular books and classics including Gone Girl, Stephen King's The Dead Zone, and Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Are you ready to create real, engaging characters that will keep your readers turning pages? Download Creating Compelling Characters from the Inside Out today, listen to the audiobook, or order the workbook edition. You can find a link in the show notes or find this book and other books on writing craft at writingasasecondcareer.com or in the nonfiction tab on my author website, lisalilly.com. There is so much paralleling of the first, which is the first evil and the first the first slayer buffy is deeply disturbed as something black swirls out and goes toward buffy they say it must become one with her it will make her ready for the fight and buffy asks how by making her less human they tell her that's how it was before that's how it will always be the blackness goes into buffy's mouth and eyes and around her body and we cut to a commercial I see this as the last major plot turn. It should grow from the midpoint, as it does here, from Buffy's commitment to declaring an emergency, diving into that portal, and it should take the story in another new direction and raise the stakes. And here it does, because now it is about what does Buffy do with this uh, attempt to force more demonic power on her and it raises the stakes because she must choose there are so many choices here willow had to choose buffy has to choose and she too is facing that dividing line the interplay of power and evil of good and evil potentially she doesn't know what this will do to her she screams as more of that black goes into her and she watches it swirling above her as well and struggles with her change. She tells them to make this stop. They say it's what she came for. Don't fight it. The scene cuts to Spike. He's getting his black leather duster out of the boxes in the school basement. He stalks out wearing his coat. And I hadn't even realized that we did not see him wearing it all season until now very symbolic of Spike needing to draw on the old Spike. Is it the evil Spike? Because even with the chip, he was moving toward being good. Something else I explore in the new patron episode, Angel versus Riley versus Spike, looking at Buffy's love life. I feel like Spike's arc builds so well right up to the beginning of season six even part way through and then it it kind of derails because of this issue of well can spike truly be good without a soul here he is tapping into that old self however we see it and it is also that interplay of do you have to be evil to get power can he get in touch with his power and his joy in the kill without becoming evil. Even more symbolic of that and also key to our season plot is Robin is lurking. He has followed Spike and he says to Spike, nice coat, where do you get it? And Spike responds, New York. So previously, Spike would not tell Robin where he had been before, but this confirms for Robin that 
This is the vampire who killed his mother because that's where she was killed. And we know from flashbacks that Spike stole a Slayer's coat after killing her. In the circle at the Summer's house, Willow chants in Latin and then gets frustrated, says, screw it, she sucks in Latin, she's the one in charge, open this portal now. Her eyes are completely black. Xander wants her to back off. Kennedy says she's getting it. And Xander says, or something's getting her. He tells her to take a break. Willow yells no, and she thrusts her arms behind her. Light streaks out of them to Anya and Kennedy and Dawn and kind of freezes them. Then they all collapse and the portal opens. Xander drags Willow, now exhausted, out of the circle. We're at the climax where the opposing forces have their final clash and resolve the main conflict. It's hard to pick out just one scene here. The previous moment where Willow gets that portal open is part of the climax for her part of the plot. Now we are going to get some inner cutting between Buffy with those men and the force of the demon and Spike fighting a demon in Sunnydale. Spike fights, he's getting beat up badly, but he gets in some great blows himself, and he is clearly enjoying it, taunting the demon, laughing. He yells in joy and lunges at it. The scene cuts to Buffy, who tells the men she didn't come all this way to get knocked up by some demon dust. She tells them that they can't fight the first, they're just men, the men who did this to whoever that girl was before she became the first slayer, and that they violated her because they're weak and pathetic and they made her kill for them. Buffy breaks free, she swings those chains at them, they fight back with their staffs. The scene cuts to Spike fighting the demon, he breaks its neck and throws it down, then he lights a match on the demon's skin and says a tussle like that, quote, it's good for the soul, end quote, and lights his cigarette. The scene cuts to Buffy, who has gotten free and fought the men successfully, and she walks toward the leader, and much as Spike broke the demon's neck, she breaks the leader's staff. The other two men drop to the ground. Buffy says, I knew it. It's always the staff. The leader tells her they offered her power. She says, tell her something she doesn't know, and he says, as you wish, and puts his hand on the side of her face, looking somber, and there's a flash of light. We're now moving into the falling action where the writer's tie-up loose ends and resolved subplots. That moment with Spike lighting the match, saying the tussle is good for the soul, is really part of the falling action. It shows how Spike feels, although you could see it as part of the climax for him of reclaiming his relish for the kill and his power. The moment with that flash of light when Buffy is clearly shown something that we don't see yet, I see that as part of the climax because that is what resolves Buffy's quest to learn about the first slayer, but more important, to get help fighting the first. And as we'll find out, she loses. In the climax, the antagonist or protagonist, one or the other, wins, loses, or wins at an incredible cost. And here, Buffy loses. She doesn't gain anything from all of this other than to become more overwhelmed about the force she is facing, as we'll find out at the end. The falling action starts with Spike hauling the demon, now dead, into the Summer's home. Kennedy and Anya look shocked that he managed it, and we cut to Buffy looking stunned and worried as she looks at the leader. Spike throws the demon in, Buffy appears in exchange in the living room. She sees everyone so battered and the whole place wrecked. Buffy looks somber and they all stare at each other in silence. At 37 minutes 43 seconds, Kennedy walks slowly in the upstairs hall toward the bedroom. 
Willow follows, asking if Kennedy is okay. She's been kind of quiet since. And Kennedy says, you suck the life out of me. Willow responds, yeah, since then. Willow tells Kennedy it's important that she knows what Willow's like, how it works. Kennedy says she thought it would be cool, but it just hurt. Willow's sorry, but Kennedy was the most powerful person nearby, and that's how Willow works. Kennedy claims she gets it, Willow told her, but then she says, I'll see you in the morning, and goes into the room looking shaken. So for the third time, I think this episode, I say, ugh, Kennedy. I get that it's one thing to have someone tell you something and another to experience it. But there was so much Kennedy already saw, including Willow turning into Warren. Nothing seemed to make her rethink her initial comment about magic just being fairy tale crap. And it's hard for me to see Kennedy as anything other than willfully sticking to her own ideas, even in the face of all logic. And then when she is forced to reckon with reality, she blames Willow. If she had said something to indicate, yeah, not just you told me, but you told me and I wouldn't listen to you. And I'm sorry I didn't listen to you. Or I'm sorry I didn't listen to you and I'm, I'm overwhelmed right now. It's not your fault. I need a break. She wouldn't have to articulate all of that. But something from which we could infer that Kennedy is reckoning with her own hubris or her own willful ignorance and with how dismissive she was of Willow, it would make me like her more or empathize with her, whether I liked her more or not. But instead, the way she's written, it, it's, it's like she is blaming Willow and I get that that's more dramatic, that's more heartbreaking for Willow, but it adds to that sense of why does Willow want to be with Kennedy, someone who's so dismissive of her and then blames her. Willow, though, doesn't seem that disturbed. She goes to Buffy's room, she smiles a little and asks how Buffy is. Buffy is still dressed, but she's sitting in bed with the covers halfway up, and she says, thanks for bringing me back, again. And Willow says, that's what I do. Buffy apologizes for being hard on them earlier. Willow says she had to be, but kisses and Twinkies also good motivating tools. Willow again asks if Buffy's okay. Buffy thinks she made a mistake. She was offered more power, and she turned it down because she didn't like the loophole. Willow says they'll get by, but Buffy doesn't know. They showed her that the first Slayer was right. It isn't enough. Willow asks her what they showed her. The scene cuts to underground, and we see a giant, endless army of vicious Turricans, that uber vamp that Buffy barely defeated. And that's where the episode ends. Notably, those Turakans seem joyful, ready to fight, a little bit similar to Spike's joy in fighting. So we're seeing another layer on that or another question raised about the interplay of power and evil. That is it, other than foreshadowing. If you find the way I talk about plot structure helpful and want to try it for your own writing, you can download free story structure worksheets at writingasasecondcareer.com slash worksheets. If you're not sticking around for the foreshadowing section, thank you so much for listening and a special thank you to patrons who support the podcast. In addition to the recent episode on Buffy, War, and Power, you can check out a brand new one on Buffy's love life that I mentioned earlier, Angel vs. Riley vs. Spike. Look in the Collections tab on Patreon at patreon.com slash Lisa M. Lily. And I hope everyone will come back in two weeks for Season 7, Episode 16, Storyteller, 
where Andrew videos everyone and is forced to reckon with his past, and the gang must close the seal of Danthazar. Now we are back for foreshadowing, which does include spoilers. When Anya suggests maybe they just leave Buffy out there to fend for herself, this foreshadows her attitude when everyone throws Buffy out of the house in empty places, especially Anya's comment about if Buffy's so superior, let her figure it out. Because later, Anya will question, well, why is Buffy the leader? Sure, she's stronger than everyone else, but she didn't earn it. And she says Buffy was just given these gifts. Which is true and not true. It's true that Buffy didn't choose to become the slayer. She didn't earn being a potential slayer or becoming the actual slayer. At the same time, as I'm sure I'll talk about then, one of the things that bugs me is it negates everything we have seen Buffy do, all the sacrifices she's made, and her choices time and time again to continue to be the slayer and protect the world. So I, I don't like that all that is, is ignored, not just by Anya, but by everyone in that episode. But this episode does do a great job of setting up how Anya apparently feels about Buffy. Buffy's question in the dream to Chloe, it is Chloe, right, foreshadows the disconnect between Buffy and the potentials of everyone. I find it most understandable that they blame Buffy and want to push her out and have Faith lead because they feel more connected to Faith, and Faith calls Buffy out on not even knowing their names. This is a good way to show that Buffy is struggling with how to be a leader for these potential slayers and the guilt she feels over not being able to connect with them. I should add, I do keep saying they force Buffy out of the house, We'll see how it plays out. I believe it is mainly Dawn who says you can't stay here because Faith is asking Buffy, can you follow? Can she go along with it if Faith is the leader? But it seems like it's Dawn who says, you know, you can't stay here if you're not with us. I guess that's it. She says, if you can't be with us on this. And Buffy says, I can't stay here and watch this happen, which ultimately I feel like is really throwing Buffy out of the house. But we'll talk about that more when we get there. There are some minor foreshadowings of the next episode, Storyteller. We're reminded that Andrew used to be evil, and he will have to confront that in Storyteller. All these characters dealing with this line between being good, being evil, the interplay of power and evil in a thematic way sets up Storyteller as well because Andrew has to come to terms with the choices that he made when he was part of the trio or to join the trio. And since then, when it was just him and the first, Andrew probably is the least powerful overall of all these characters. He definitely is. And yet, interestingly, he is the one who struggles the most to accept his choices and who he is. So I'm interested to get to Storyteller and look more at that aspect of Andrew's character. Finally, this episode sets up the finale where Buffy rejects the entire idea of the Slayer line and shares her power with all the other potentials. In this episode, she's concerned that she should have accepted the power despite that it might make her more demonic and less human because if she is the only one 
who can fight, at least drawing on supernatural powers, that seems to suggest she should have accepted that. And instead, she will find another way, as Willow says, they will find another way together, which is to create a true army of slayers by sharing and letting all of them become slayers. So this episode, so pivotal in setting all of that up. I'm sure there's much more I could talk about, but this episode has gotten long enough. Thank you again for listening. Please come back in two weeks for the next episode, Season 7, Episode 16, Storyteller, where Andrew must face his past choices and the gang must find a way to close the seal of Damphazar that was opened with Xander's blood. To hear more Buffy in the Art of Story content, Listen to each regular podcast episode a couple days early and access my course, How to Write a Novel from Idea to First Draft. Check out joining the Patreon community at patreon.com slash Lisa M. Lilly. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash L-I-S-A Emerson Marie L-I-L-L-Y. You can find back episodes of Buffy in the Art of Story on YouTube or on my author website, lisalilly.com. You'll also find all my fiction there, as well as my nonfiction books for writers and the Buffy in the Art of Story books. Post questions or comments on the Patreon page, on the Buffy in the Art of Story Facebook page, or email me at buffystorypod at gmail.com. Music for this episode was written and performed by Robert Newcastle. Buffy and the Art of Story is a production of Spiny Woman, LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved. <laughs>